Good morning and welcome to the show. This is Susie Marsh from Behavioral Solutions with Choosing Life, Addictions, Mental Health and Recovery. The show dedicated to your emotional, mental and spiritual healing and rejuvenation. This show is a public affairs presentation from B98.5 FM. We have a great show today. Um, One of my favorite people is here. I've only met Roy Mills one time, and that was when Betty Eady was here promoting her book, Ripple On. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about his book, The Soul's Remembrance. Roy Mills wrote, The Soul's Remembrance, Earth is Not Our Home. And I'd like to read to you a little bit from uh, the cover of this book. He remembers events that occurred before his birth, events that were as real and vivid as any experiences in this life. When he was born, he never forgot them. This was his gift, and he was told by divine beings to share these memories with no one, not with his family, not spiritual leaders, until he was given permission. Now, almost 50 years after his birth, he humbly shares the memories of a glorious world that most of humanity has forgotten. In the soul's remembrance, he reveals the enormity of this pre-mortal world, an existence in which we grew in love as we prepared for our lives on earth. He discloses our anxiousness to come here, how we selected challenges to test and strengthen us, challenges that would become sources of joy here and hereafter. Um, He details encounters with Jesus, Mary, and God, reveals how he selected his life's mission with the Father's help, and then how, filled with both sorrow and anticipation, he was escorted from heaven to begin his mortal life. He was born into his chosen family, a single mother living with her parents. Immediately, he became the cause of changes in the family. And Roy's going to tell us his story and what this was like. It is almost unbelievable. You know, when I met Betty Edie and heard her story, it was it's hard to believe. And hearing Roy's story was even more difficult to believe. Um, But I just tend to trust my intuition and the feelings that I get when I have met both of these people. What happened with Roy after he read her book, it seems like he connected with her and told her what he had remembered. And in in the uh, foreword to this book, Betty says that he told her things that she had never published because she didn't think it was time for people to know. So she completely believed Roy's story because there were things that had happened to her that she had not yet told anybody. And she felt like it was now time for these things to be related publicly. She felt like um, she was led to publish this book because he could not get it published. Again, the book, The Soul's Remembrance, it's a wonderful little book. You can read it very quickly. Um, It's heart-touching. It's heart-inspiring. And Roy Mills is himself a very unique character. He is, or he was, a safety and security officer for a wood processing plant. He's from southeast Georgia. He lives with his wife, Phyllis, and he is the father of three sons, the grandfather of two, and again, lives in southeast Georgia. He's 48 years old. And Roy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Susie. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start from the beginning. Um, tell us what happened, how how you could go so many years and not remember any of this, and then all of a sudden, um, were you reading Betty's book? What led you to think, this is time? I was all, I've always had this memory. I was born with this memory. I was born without the veil of, of forgetfulness placed around my memory when I was born. I got a conscious memory of being all the way back since I was created. I never forgot it. It's and just I, so hard to believe. And it was a special mission that God sent me to do uh, here on this earth. This is my mission. But I was also born with the instructions not to reveal my memories to anyone until I was told to uh, to uh, reveal these memories. So uh, one night in April 1995, an angel appeared in my bedroom somewhere around about 2 o'clock in the morning and instructed me it was time to, to write the books. And uh, after we talked for a while, she slowly glided backwards and disappeared through my closed bedroom door. And uh, I just laid there th- remembering uh, heaven and just basking in the, the great feeling that comes with angel visits and angels has always visited me all my life and uh, ne- the next morning I'm no writer at all but the next morning when I got up I had an overwhelming compelling urge to write and I just couldn't quit writing I, I wrote for seven hours didn't even take a break and and I for the next days and weeks and months I wrote every time I got a, mo- a free moment to get these memories down on uh, paper I wrote the whole book longhand with with an ink pen and pencil 
Well, I, you know, one of the reasons I can believe um, that this has happened to you is because when I, <coughs> two months after I stopped drinking and drugging and really began to pray to be um, relieved of that compulsion, I had a very, very, very strange spiritual experience that only people that have had them right. can understand when, I mean, I remember being on my knees and then I don't remember how I got to the bed and laid there, you know, sort of being overwhelmed with pure love. And it was so scary. I didn't tell anybody because I thought it would go away. It was higher than any drug could put you there. And I did hallucinogens. And the, I couldn't even compare it to acid, LSD, or ecstasy. I know. I know. Because there's nothing like it. And so, I, and I didn't tell anybody for a long time because I thought it was supposed to be a secret. And Well, you understand when I say I was laying there basking in this wonderful glowing <coughs> spiritual and physical feeling that you just can't express it with words and especially my vocabulary i got a limited vocabulary so i really struggle to try to express it but there's no drug nowhere on this earth that even come close to the the, the feeling that you'll get from these visits and and from jesus being in the presence of jesus the same way and god gives you the same thing well i'd like to have more of that so so it's hard for me to believe those of you that are listening probably think it's it's unbelievable too but um like uh, a physician recently has been talking about in his book that he wrote up three books about near-death experiences until he was with a uh, media escort he had never prayed and he prayed that night and then within 24 hours had a similar experience oh. and here he was writing about it as a pediatrician about all these children's visits with god and with jesus and mm -hmm. whoever their angel guides were and so he finally had the experience so um, I guess for people that are skeptics, don't don't believe anybody else. Go straight to the source and say, "Hey, I'd like to have this." And you got to pray every day and every night to right. have one for quite a while if, you, if right. you're like it, me. If you knock, it'll be given to you, absolutely. But you got to knock. You got to be knock honest and purely from your heart, and it'll be given to you. It might take a while for some people. For me, it took quite a while, quite a time prayer. Okay, well, let's hear your story. So, so then it's April. She says for you to write. So you start writing. And then what happened? Yeah, at that point, I, when I got through with the manuscripts, I, let me back up previous to this. And uh, my wife, Phyllis, had been sick for quite a while, uh, for many years. And it was Christmas Eve, 1994. And she hadn't done any Christmas shopping, for, you know, that she likes to shop. She was so sick. And that particular day, she got the feeling real good good enough to go shopping. So I carried it to a store some miles away from home, uh, about 20 miles. And we got there. She, she went into the latest section, and I went just walking around the store. This wasting time, because Phyllis is a long shopper if she ever gets started. Four or five hours is nothing unusual for her. My but kind it, of woman. Yeah. Then as I walked along through the store, I seen this beautiful light it looked like a butterfly it had the movement of a butterfly but it was round and had a gold band around and it just kind of floated across the store and i was i watched this light because it went right by people and they didn't even see it and i did so i went and followed this light and when i got within three or four feet of it i saw where it went it went to the, over the book section there this particular book called embraced by the light was there and the light stopped on this book and disappeared and i picked this book up and i, I, I have no idea why I did it. I didn't even open it. I picked it up, looked at it, and held it to my chest. Very uncharacteristic of me. Anybody that knows me would say Royal Mills would not do such a thing, but I did. I quickly opened and thumbed through it, and I knew everything she had, had put in there. I read every As I read, I understood, and I knew this is true. And I went and bought the book and went to the concession stand and read this book. Well, I, I, that was in... <clears throat> Excuse me. That was Christmas Eve in '94. So the angel came in '95 in April, told me to write the books. And after I got my manuscripts down, Phyllis and I talked about this. Well, it was real plain. My the, my experience was on Christmas Eve also. Oh, '82. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, it was real plain. It was just as plain as anything. I felt compelled that Betty. I had to contact Betty. But I didn't have any idea how to contact Betty. And so I got the phone and uh, called Seattle, Washington. I know she lived there. And uh, got uh, Betty Edie's phone number. And I called this Betty Edie up. And it wasn't Betty Edie that I was looking for. It was a Betty Edie, the doctor. <coughs> uh, there's a doctor in, in Seattle called Betty Edie, named C uh, Betty Edie. And she said, I know who you're talking about. I don't have her phone number, but I got 
her uh, uh, newsletter. So this doctor mailed me this newsletter, which had an 800 number in it, and I finally got up with her son, which is a literary agent at the time, and he said, sure, send me the manuscripts. So I sent them up to you. And uh, to make a long story short, we went back and forth two or three years with these manuscripts back and forth, and finally it was time to send out. We sent our my manuscripts to 20 different publishers, turned down by each and every one of them consistently. Well, listen to this. This is the divine way of God. So Tom talked to his mom, who was Betty Edie, and they felt so compelled by it that she went and started a publishing company to publish my book. Of course, she published other people's books too, but that was the initial start. Is is because they wouldn't. God used that those manuscripts to just put her to the next step that she had to go through. And uh, with that, Tom got behind it, and we've been selling books ever ever since. It's it's really selling good. It's a really a controversial book. I, everybody that reads the books got questions, and I try to answer all the emails and and answer all the letters and the phone calls. And you, if you're interested out there, you go get you can order a book or go to your local bookstore or get a book by calling 1-800-433-8978. 433-8978. The name of the book is The Soul's Remembrance, Earth is Not Our Home. The author is Roy Mills, and Onjinjinkta Press, which means Rose in Bloom, is the publisher, and that's Betty Edie's Press. So, um, Roy, tell us what it was like. What do you Tell us what you remember. Oh, uh, the first thing I can remember, as far as back I can, as I can remember, being in a place of very bright light. Everything glowed wonderful light, and within this light was love, too. It was the same type of love that you experienced, and I experienced, and the angel came. It was that love that was there everywhere. Can you imagine being in a place for eons with that kind of love? It was just tremendous, and that's the way heaven is. It, it, you just cannot fathom the love that's, that's in heaven waiting on us. That's why it's so important that we all find our way back to heaven to make sure let's don't do nothing that we don't go back to heaven. Let's choose heaven. That's the way to go. And uh, it, the, there was buildings there, huge buildings that glowed tremendous light. And within these buildings, there's lots of uh, rooms in them. And they, and these were teaching. And this is when I was coming to earth. I went through those teaching rooms. And these rooms were teaching a certain specific thing, and uh, which I learned a lot of a lot of things there. I met my family there. I met my my children that I've, that's been born to me. We all agreed to come here as a family unit. I met my mother and father there. They and when we was there, we was all the same size. We weren't like grown ups and little children. We was all the same size. But they as, assumed the role when they they b- was born for I as my mother and father. Then I sing, sing the role of my children's father. So we we all come here in units. Some is earlier and some later. We uh, we also met our friends there and a lot of acquaintance. And also I met my wife there. And we made a lot of plans while we was there. And it's it nearly as if we pl- pre-plan our life and then come down here and execute and carry these plans out. Uh, and they came into this room. That grow tre- that glow tremendous bright light within this room. There was a stand there, a table about five foot tall, and this huge white book was on this table, and it grow- glowed bright light too. And this angel placed me in front of this book, and she spoke to the book. She never touched it. She spoke to the book, and it opened. It it did what she said, and this angel just said, "Look into this book and tell me what you see." And when I the book opened, and I looked into it. I said, "I don't see nothing but pure white pages." And she said, look into it and concentrate. And when I did, I didn't read the book. I watched the book. It worked just like a TV. It showed me about one part of my life, and the page returned. It showed me about another event in my life. And this, these events was substantial and to some degree, and others was, you know, didn't seem substantial at all. And during my teachings, while I was there, I went back to this book many times, many times. And I got concerned and asked the angel. I said, well, when I'm born, how am I going to recognize these events how am i going to know and she said you'll recognize them after you're born as they manifest into reality and said you'll go someplace and it seems that you've been there before or you'll meet someone and even though you never met them before you'll recognize them and know them 
and she went as far as said people on earth calls it deja vu but it's all when you have these deja vus it's all it's your spirit it's recognizing what it saw in this life book and that's that's the way you find keep on your path it's the road you chose they show you in this book it's the path you chose as long as you have any deja vus you're pretty well on your life path that you chose and uh it's uh I've had deja vu's quite often, you know, and and thank God I'm, I'm hopefully I'm still on my path. So um, some of us chose very difficult family situations, right? And, and, and even I did. And my, at the age of three, I was given away by my mother, uh, and uh, it was really a sad thing. But I remember, you tell know, tell us that story because I read about it in your book. Uh, it's a real difficult area for me to talk about. And uh, you don't have to. everything, but uh, anyway, during the ordeal, it, when you read the book, it tells about during that time that I was going through this trauma that uh, I did have a deja vu and I remember this stuff, even though I remembered it, I still experienced the physical hurt, even even though you, you remember these things, you still this is that hurt that goes along with it, and uh. The reason we had to come to this earth in the beginning is we had to understand love and experience. See, you can just learn so much in heaven, as strange as that sounds, but there's no, nothing negative in heaven. You had to come to earth where there's negative as this on earth. So there's so much of our life experiences, like your drug addiction, which through negative actions, something beautiful positive comes from it. And and God knows that, he, and He used negativity sometime in our life to to sharpen and hone us into a great spirit of beings that otherwise we would not be if we hadn't no spirit set. So when you were three years old and you're remembering this, um, it still hurt you, and you couldn't tell anybody about it. I couldn't tell anyone. Uh -uh. And the family, because I, I remember, I read your book when I first got it, which was like months ago, so I, I'm not remembering the details, but you went to this other family, and then what happened? Uh, my mother finally left and uh, left me with my grandmother. My grandmother and grandfather raised me, and we was, at one point, they was nine of us in that house, a two-bedroom farmhouse, and the conditions were really rough. But I want to go back one step, and, and when I come out of heaven, now, th this is really important to lots and lots of people out there. In my final, my very last day that I was in heaven, I was taken to an exit room. And it tells about what an exit room is in the book. And we entered this huge room as big as a sports stadium. And it glows so bright it looks like someone had painted it using sunlight for paint. It glows so bright. And the angel, my angel guy and I was the only ones in that particular room. And it had huge columns that run from the floor to the ceiling. And just tremendously. If you can just picture this bright, shining place. And uh, we was waiting for our angel guy to bring me to earth. And we had walked into this room at quite a distance. Suddenly I heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And a huge door appeared in the side of the exit room This giant warrior angel stepped in and the door disappeared behind him and this this angel had to be seven eight maybe nine foot tall it was a tremendous angel and as soon as my angel guy saw this angel her eyes got real big and her mouth opened and she said i can't believe he came himself to take you to earth and as we continued to walk over there he kept she kept saying that you know along the way this angel it was a very strong, muscular-looking angel. And he was wearing a different kind of robe than the rest of the angels I saw in the heaven. This angel was wearing a robe made out of sheep's wool. And it hung all the way to his feet. And he was wearing no shoes at all. If you ever saw the Shroud of Turin, this was not the angel on the Shroud of Turin. I'll I just go ahead and clarify this. But his face looked nearly identical to the, the face on uh, the giant angel that brought me to earth. Uh, he had long beard and had a square rectangular strong looking face but as we got closer I, I quit talking I wouldn't say nothing because I know you ain't supposed to be intimidated in heaven but this angel was so huge I just weren't going to start nothing you know what I mean I <laughs> 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 and uh, my angel guide and this angel 
started talking, and they talked for a while, and in just a few minutes, this tall angel looked at me and said, are you ready? And I said, yes. And I weren't going to say no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and he reached and took me by my left arm, and instantly the door reappeared in the side of the exit room, and we went out with the sound of a mighty rushing wind as we went out, and we started descending. And, you know, it was it, heaven was on this home I'd ever known at that time. And my angel guy was in the door and she was waving by and I was trying to wave by, by back. And as it was descended on down just a, just a little piece from the, from the exit room, the door disappeared again. And it was strange because uh, the exit room in heaven become transparent. You could see right through it. it. If you ever looked through a glass of water or something, you could actually see it, but you could see through it. And I continued to watch as we descended on down slower, slowly. And after we got a certain distance, all of heaven totally disappeared. I could not see heaven at all. It was gone as far as visual sight. And this tall angel that was with me could see that I was very concerned about this. And he looked at me and he said, look straight ahead, said don't look back. So we came on down until we got close to the earth. And we stopped several hundred yards above the earth. And, and I said, why don't we stop for? He said, well, I'm looking to see if your mother is in the house. And there was an old run-down farmhouse in the distance. And he, he said, I'm looking to see if your mother's in the house. And after confirming that she was, we descended on down to about 20, 25 feet above the ground and traveled horizontal then towards the house. And once we got to the house, we only paused in, uh, briefly on the porch. And we traveled right through the wall, went right into this house. And I still remember that little ping I had on the end of my nose as I passed through the, that wall of that house, like a soap bubble or something. You know, if you ever have one bust on any of your nose, you know what that feels like. And once we got inside the house, there were three individuals in there. And uh, he said, uh, make your way around and look at them. So I, I looked at first my grandfather and my grandmother, and then I went to my mother and looked at her. And I recognized the voice instantly because the angel guy that was with me had started talking to me uh, way before I was born in my mother's voice, using my mother's voice, and she said that's where I'll be used to it when I was born. So once I got there uh, and looked, at one point she looked straight at me, and I thought she could see me. And I could feel the love just radiate from her. And I had great compassion and love for this, this lady. And about that time, the angel guy said, come here. So I went back over. He looked at me again and said, are you ready? And I said, yes. So he carried me back over to where I was within three or four feet of her and gave me a gentle push or glide. And instantly, I was in, inside my fetal body, instantly. Well... That was a trauma. See, I was used to everything running smooth and organized and everything in heaven. And when I entered that fetal body, the heart in this thing was beating so fast that I, I called back to my angel guy, and I said, I'm fixing to get thrown out of here. He's going to throw me out. I can't stay in here. And uh, I didn't know what a heart was at that moment. And uh, I said, can you slow it down or stop it? And he thought it was kind of amusing. He, he said, surely that's one thing that you don't want me to do. And uh, he said, just bear with it, and you'll get used to it. And I did. And uh, he, he said, direct your, thro your thoughts to the fetal body. It's mine. But and at that point, now, my fetal body couldn't have been over a month and a half, two months old. I, I was so amazed, and I still stand all amazed, at the profound knowledge possessed at that early age. It very, as capable as you and I today, had that much knowledge. I, I just really sat down sometime and get lost in, in that thought. How, what kind of knowledge this body had. Uh, well, we're going to have to take, a, believe it or not, a short break for commercials. So those of you that are listening, you are hearing the voice of Roy Mills, who's in the studio today, telling us about his memories of, of heaven pre-birth and the book is The Soul's Remembrance Earth is Not Our Home we'll be right back welcome back and we are talking with Roy Mills and he's in the middle of the story of remembering his birth and um, the knowledge that fetal 
that babies have. And you said yeah. at about a month and a half, two months. That I, I, my fetal body was about a month and a half to two months old when I entered my fetal body. Outside the body or in the in the mother's body? In the mother, in the mother. I went. I was in the fetal body within the mother. So that's where the angel delivered me to my fetal body within my mother's womb. So I was so profound. Uh, the questions that this fetal body asked me right off the bat it's so profound that I I didn't put it in the souls of members regretfully but I just shared with it shortly well, you know us. the very first thing once I connected with the, the fetal body's thought was he asked me said when he, he was referred to himself he said when I die are you going to heaven so and he insisted that I ask the tall angel now I asked the tall angel. I said he wants to know when he dies, am I going to heaven? And the tall angel said, it, "It's highly unusual for this question to be answered or asked, but you can tell him yes. When you die, you are going to go to heaven." So you know why? Because at that small age, this fetal body knew about resurrection. He knew when he died that he'd be resurrected again at end times. He that was what he he wanted to live again. That is how profound. The, the knowledge that a fetal body, a fetal's got, is at, at that point. Actually. And uh, for a while there, we actually thought with two different thought lines. I had a physical thought line and a spiritual, but it wasn't long before they joined together in one complete thought line. Well, as time grew on... So wait, wait, I have to ask you this. So, so okay, tell us then about abortion. Uh, to me, that... It's a real taboo thing to have an abortion, you know. Uh, to me, I just tell you straight out, the lady can get forgiveness. You know, that's what Jesus is all about. But anybody committing abortion for money, I don't want ever how to have that on my head when I go to heaven and do a life review because you are going to experience the pain that you inflict on anyone, whether it's abortion or shooting or stabbing, you go on to walk the mile in their shoes, and I guarantee you it's going to happen. So those abortion people, whoever it may be out there, it's going to get to feel what they've done. They're going to get to feel how it feels to get dismembered for each and every one they did. And that's that's a gimme there. That They ain't going to avoid that. Even if they get on their hands and knees and say, Jesus, you're still going to go through this life review but you'll have forgiveness for it. So, so it's what about what about in cases of um, a young girl who is incested or raped? Uh, once again, I go back and stand on what I said. God knows what he's doing when they're born. Even though it seems like a very unorthodox ways that it comes about, but all things is did through God. You know, and to me, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I know everybody's got an opinion, but as far as I'm concerned, I'd, I'd have to let it continue and be born. I would, because that's a human being, even though, you know, it, it's really bad. And we got to think about life. We can't think about my feelings or what other people think. we got to think about this person's life. 30 years down the road when we are dead and gone, this person's life... How much good is it going to do? And how much glory is it going to show to God? How, what are we going to do when we get back up there? I said, well, it was incest. And he says, yeah, but it was my child. What are we going to do? You know, got to think about this. It's deep. <laughs> well, I don't have a comment. <laughs> so um, when you're in the body, then the baby can sense even the spirit now tell us a little bit more about talking to this warrior angel when you're in, so you're still connected with him before you're born right yeah i can i can still communicate with even my angel guides in heaven and when you're in the, the womb and i can very well remember it fluently i considered myself not in heaven but i was not on earth yet as far as right i was halfway between and the lines of communication with the angels are still open. You can fluently talk to them. But for the most part, they need to talk to you first before you can talk to them. It ain't like I could initiate the conversation. They would talk to me, and then I could converse with them. Also, let me go a little bit further in here. I knew 
being that I was part of my mother at that time, I knew her thoughts. I felt her emotions, everything. There's no secrets there. There's no secrets. Whatever she knows, you know. What about all those young kids that don't want those babies? And they're carrying them for nine months, and they're, it's, it must be horrible for those infants. Well, it is. It, it is. It's a tro- rejection that's really tough to deal with. Because when you come from heaven, love is the number one thing. That is it. And rejection, it, it just it hurts you so much because you want love to, to be the number one thing on earth also. Uh, you see how, when a baby is born how happy they are all the time? That's the way we're supposed to stay. It's the world environment that changes us. If you take one individual that never was polluted by earthbound thinking, that would be one happy individual. We, we, we don't choose to be... Uh, polluted because God puts us here in a, a perfect state, a perfect happiness. And, and through earthbound environments and earthbound thinking and ways, we become unhappy and get caught up in it. So why do you think that um, when you were in the fetal body that you had that question or that your body had that question to your soul, am I going to heaven? Because um, the angel said that's very unusual. Why do you, what do you make of that? I'm curious. I really have thought about it quite a bit why that I think my fetal body might have thought that that was a ideal time to ask that question being so this angel was such a high authority angel and would know and it, it was his concern that's basically the only thing I can tell you that that was his number one concern in all of his life was to know that if I went to heaven, he knew that he would live a life out, time out and die and be resurrected and live again. Because in a fetal world, life is what counts. Life is what counts. In spirit world, love, and we had to teach our fetal body love, you know. So um, because it's been so long and, and I'm being veiled from the memory because I love to be surprised on the air, who is the angel again? Tell but us the story about that. It was not Jesus, and it wasn't God either. I know both of them. I know exactly what they look like. But uh, do you think it was Michael? No, it wasn't Michael. Uh, I would just like to guess. You know, if I just guess, and I don't know this, what this angel. I'd say it was King David, because the angels had told me that I was being born under King David, and and uh, so I would like to think. That was King David uh-huh. that brought me down. Wow. And uh, that's just my guess. And yeah. And kind of putting stuff together that they had said during the time I was there. Well, Roy, then what, um, and I think I asked Betty this. So what about people who do not believe in Jesus, but who are very, very, very spiritual and who have saved many people? I mean, what about Jewish people? What about, I'm thinking of people that I know that are incredible, loving beings well, with, with Jesus, I chose Jesus as my way to come back to heaven. But what about the fundamentalists say, if you don't, you know, fundamentalist religion says that's the only way, period. What well, you, th- you know, you, that's kind of put me on the spot, and I don't like to talk about it. Oh. But <laughs> I know I'm sorry. that that they, I really should, I, I really don't like to say this because I was born under Jesus, and I proclaim, you know, Jesus is it. But I, I also am bound to tell the truth. And I know when I was in heaven, there's many ways back to God. There's many ways back to God. But Jesus is the one that I, is by far the easiest way. By far, he made it the easiest way. You don't have to go out and do this, and you don't have to do that, and you don't have to throw salt over your shoulder, and you don't have to do nothing. You just have to ask him to forgive your sins and let him take over from there. You know, it, it's the easiest way. And I understood that when I was in heaven. And I was taking all the shortcuts I could and trying to get the most, the most as I could get, you know. <laughs> so. Well, I, I have to agree with you that the truth is there are many paths. And part of that's because being an alcoholic and a drug addict 18 years ago, um, it was 18 years this December yeah. um, that I had that experience. But um, 18 years ago, there was no way I could have chosen a more religious path. And many years later, I did. But, but I began to have these spiritual experiences in the only way that I could relate 
and of course being a 20 something years old they were more <laughs> more like the drug culture yeah. you know these bizarre experiences and but thank goodness those eventually brought me to a path that was easier um, but I knew I just knew that that that, that was what what people in these 12-step meetings taught me that that was also a path uh, along with religion and of course you grow and you change what right. what keeps you spiritual 20 years ago doesn't necessarily keep you spiritual right. today but um so i i'm glad you said that because i know that there are many people that are godly people who may not believe what i believe um well we have probably 10 minutes so i don't want to keep talking about what i want to hear i know that other people are interested in your story well let me finish up my birth story this has seemed to be an interesting spot for everybody that's ever w- listened uh at, after this is all over with i and we, i settled in to my physical body real good i was pretty satisfied where i was at you know i could thank my mother's thoughts and i felt great love for her and I could actually still talk to the angels, you know, back and forth. And I was satisfied until one day, quite a while later, something strange started happening to me. I be- began to turn over to right, to my right side. Slowly but surely, I began to turn mm-hmm. over and over until I was completely bottom side upwards, which took a while. And then I started traveling down, which took another while. Well, as I traveled down, you know, I was really dissatisfied the whole time from... Once I started turning over, I was dissatisfied, but I tried to tolerate it, and I figured, well, I'll stop for my head hit bottom, but the next thing I know, I was born, and the first thing I can remember being born is the doctors and nurses are arguing about something, and it, I was born into a real cold atmosphere. I like to froze to death. I, I, you know, I, I remember the cold, and uh, one of them come over and spanked my bottom, and when I took it, uh, breath of air I could actually it was so it hurt so bad but I actually could hear it sound like a paper sack being watered up it just a crackling sound and here in the last few years I talked to a doctor and he said it was the air sacs expanding for the first time that crackle sound I heard but each time I took a breath it would hurt but it tapered off over a period of time and they finally got me and uh, got me all cleaned up and gave them to my mother you know and I first time I felt real safe and, and secure since I had left heaven, actually, because I was finally on earth. You know what I mean? I was finally there in the physical, you know, outside where I could actually look and see things. So everything was pretty good, but we didn't have no transportation. We, I was, we was extremely poor in those days, no transportation. So one of my uncles came up and carried uh, my mother and myself to the house, the old farmhouse, and when we got there, she took me and held me up so that I could see out the window as if she was showing me this house. And she said, this is your new home. This is where you'll be living at. Of course, she was living with them too at that time. And instantly, when I saw it, I recognized it because I'd been there only a few months earlier with the the angels, the big angel. And she carried me on in the house and been, there was nine people going to be in this house and it's only a two-bedroom farmhouse. Bedding was in a great demand at the time. So they had took an old steamer trunk and put quilts on top of it and put chairs around it, kind of ma- like a makeshift baby bed thing, and placed me on it. But uh, as soon as they put me down, I knew I knew everything. I, I knew what was going to happen before it happened, and I could look at them. I knew what they were thinking. My, if... The day I was born, the very instant I was born, if my body, my fetal body had motor skills, I could have taught right then. I had the ability. I had the knowledge and everything. But the only reason that newborn babies don't talk at birth is because of motor skills of the physical body, not the mental capability. they much, much more uh, aware, and they've got full capability of, of speaking. And the reason they cry, they make all these unusual gestures. They're trying to communicate it, you know, when they get on up some size, trying to let, communicate. But it was nothing unusual for a baby. And I still believe they possess this knowledge and abilities up to about two years old. Well, after I met you and heard your story the first time uh, when we were with Betty, uh, my step-grandbaby was born. And so after he was born, I would say things to him like, don't forget, don't forget where you were. Mm-hmm. Tell us what right. happened. 
but it was not a wonderful circumstance that he was born to a teenager. So there was yeah. a lot of stress, and I can only imagine the feelings he went through with his mother, who was just a kid. So it was, I'm sure, very stressful. Do you think that that baby can sort of sense, and he's in Texas now, can understand my thoughts? I mean, I'm not blood-related, but I was there when he was well, born. Well, I was understanding anybody I looked at. So it had to be close to him. Yeah, pretty uh, visual. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't pick up nothing long range stuff you know mm -hmm. only from angels okay but uh but visual i knew every everything and also when i was laying there there was other people that would come into that house and look at me too and it wasn't my family it'd be like in the spirits would actually come in and look at me and i recognize them but as i grew older these spirits stopped coming and i, I actually missed them you know at that point wonder where they went you know and and that was kind of a sad point because they, they, they was real good to me, and they they come and, and we talk and stuff that way. Even though I couldn't talk physically, spiritually, I could really let it roll, you know. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so we would talk and talk to the angels. And it, a child is a great spirit to be in, even at conception. And we need to recognize that. And at some point in time, I'm I'm writing some more about this, and it goes in more in depth in this area. This is the most critical area of our life that we have got to put a, a, our hand on, take control of it, and get this knowledge out that we ain't dealing with body tissue. And, of course, you know, when people do their life review, they're going to find out they weren't doing dealing with body tissue. It's not going to be a, that part of ain't going to be real good. But uh, I suggest anybody that this remotely interested in anything I'm saying to go to your local bookstore order it or you can call 1-800-433-8978 <laughs> here's our commercial break The Soul's Remembrance by Roy Mills on Jinjinkta Press that's The Soul's Remembrance Earth is Not Our Home by Roy Mills and um, I loved it I read it in one night because I just wanted to gobble it up so um, when the angels and spirits would come visit you, do you think they were just sort of giving you comfort to let you sort of get used to transitioning? It was a transition time. Yeah, that's what they did. At, at one point they told me, and we're talking about over in some a year or so, they said, well, I'm not going to be talking to you as much. I won't be communicating. This was my angel guy from heaven that uh, was telling me this because they knew that I had to become some point I had to become earthbound with, to be able to adapt and go on with my life even though I had these memories and they would, would at, from time to time remind me not to tell nobody so keep this a secret well um when you know the new age people say that we have these guides around us all the time do we have these like guides that are specifically our guides that stay with us do you right, know they do we, okay. we got I call them angel guides they, they're angels you know a lot of people like to name them off it, like some person in history you know with me you know but uh from what i know they're they, they, angels the angels that that's here watching some most everybody's got one you know i can go ahead and tell you everybody's got one and i know the people are having up to four and my wife has got four angels and let me talk about this for just briefly and and people i get a lot of questions so why do you see angels and nobody else does now this is the reason I was born without the veil of forgetfulness. My spiritual eyes is open. I can see into the spiritual world when I want to. Okay. M everyone else that I know of, with an exception of two or three, is spiritual eyes, it, the veil of forgetfulness has been put around. You can't see it. But I still believe angels can come and talk to each and every one of us. When they come and talk to us, being their spirit, they talk to your spirit. They don't talk to your physical mind. Your conscious thinking is where you at now. They come and talk to you. They remove the, shit, the the barrier between the spirit and the physical, and they talk to you. And when they leave, they place it back in. Therefore, you cannot remember the event, only if they want you to remember. It. Because if they want you to remember the event, it's it's real substantial in your life. It's something you're supposed to take that event and do something with it. But it's my belief. I'm not no special deal. Angels come and talk to everybody, but they just cannot remember it because the angels speak to the spirit. 
So what do you think about the, uh, here I'm a therapist, so I'm getting your opinion on this, uh, healing touch, therapeutic touch, are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that's helpful? Oh, yeah. Because I oh, love gosh, it. Oh, gosh, yeah. I, th- I think it's incredible, and that's been very, very helpful to me. Actually, I have it done three times this week because <laughs> I have some back pain, yeah. and it usually relieves it. So it seems like they w- they say that they work with your spirit guides. Right. They do. Okay. And uh, at any given time, these people on this earth can do anything. You know, sp- some got abilities and I was really good at discernment really good at one point now it comes and goes when I want to no people's thoughts it still comes and goes I don't have the ability to control that but these people on this earth at any given time that that can do anything they can heal through touch voice or just pray you know praying is the most wonderful gift of all you know it's like a call back home and uh, an angel told me once, he said, if you pray more, I can do more, but i got to have authority, you know. So, you know, prayer r- works. You pray, and you, they receive the authority. Tell us how to pray, Roy. I just, well, I pray a little bit different than everybody else, I would think. Because I, I know what God looks like. And I, I had a, I remember my relationship with God and Jesus. So I probably pray a little bit more. But if you're going to pray, pray from your heart. Pray from your heart and your spirit. Don't pray from your head, you know. Pray from your heart. What do you really feel in that heart and in your spirit? That's what you pray about. Roy, well, what about animals? I mean, I'm a, the first the first inkling I had that there did even exist a spirit world was when I asked God. I said, I don't know if you exist. If you do, show me. At that instant, my cat came over and rubbed against me, and I said, Okay, thank you. I know yeah. you exist. So that was the only way I could relate, you know, when I was a drug addict, that that was the only thing I knew that, okay, God does exist because animals are here. Yeah. So what about animals in heaven? People, so many people that have these experiences don't tell us they anything. Sub- uh, they do have souls. Anything that breathes air has souls. I, I would say not to the extent that we got, but when they die, they do go somewhere. They don't mix and mingle and run around the throne room with the spirits but there's a place for animals there's actually a, a place in heaven set aside for animals where you can go and visit the animals and they can you can be with them you know so i'll get to see all my pets you'll get to see them <laughs> yeah so yeah. what about the souls of all these animals that are just killed and well they go up you know they go they go straight to heaven there's no hell for no angel i mean no animal uh, they all go so they so pure they appear no matter you can take a dog and spank him and he forgives you right then you know yeah, you go spank a guy and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So they got pure souls. And I've been asked several questions. I'm going to do this real fast. And some people have approached me about the, you know, animal souls and stuff, which I, I think so much about. I'm writing about it. Oh, good. It is uh, about these animals like the cows and pigs and all this stuff that's been slaughtered for eat. Well, I'll just briefly touch on this. They knew this. These animals are, are dedicating their body for our nourishment where we can serve God. That's their personal sacrifice with their body. We've got dominion over them. That means we're higher ranking. So they, it, it's just like the, the animals, you know, like the dogs and the cats and things. So you don't think we have to be a vegetarian? We don't. Okay. No. It, it's their way uh, of uh, allowing us to use their body to nourish our bar- body to where we can serve God, and, and through this, it's actually in an indirect way, glory given them, you know. So that I can wear fur? Well, <laughs> you know, if the animal's already dead, I don't see no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a joke to my best friend who's an animal rights activist. Just kidding, Dave. I, I ain't got nothing. I don't have no fur. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, we only have a few minutes. What do you think the most important thing um, that we need to end the show with today? What do you think? Okay, beyond all other things, love. Love, forgive, and best of all, do not judge. Because God uses all circumstances for his good. What man sees as bad, God is behind using it for good. And that means a lot. That really gets into a big ball of wax there. But you just look. How many times bad things have happened to people? They wound up in prison, but they found God. So sorry we're running out of time. I could um, talk to you for about three more hours. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Roy. You're sure welcome. Anytime. Y'all just get that book. 
Bye bye. Susie Marsh is proud to announce a new segment on Choosing Life, Addictions, Mental Health, and Recovery. It's called Ask Susie. If you have a question you would like to ask, simply fax it to Susie at 404-897-SEND. That's 404-897-SEND. Thanks so much for listening today to Choosing Life, Addictions, Mental Health, and Recovery. I am your host, Susie Marsh, a licensed therapist with Behavioral Solutions Incorporated. Tapes are available by calling me at 404-873-6718. That's 404-873-6718. Remember to tune in every Sunday at 7 a.m. here on B98.5 FM. This program is a public affairs presentation of the WSB Radio Group. It's time to stop.